Okay, I think uh, we'll get started. It's a few minutes past uh, four and we have already over 70 uh, participants here. So um, welcome uh, to the fourth uh, and final meeting of the Fairbank Center's Modern Channel Lecture Series, final meeting for the semester, of course, not, uh, not otherwise. Um, my name is Arunab Ghosh. Uh, I teach modern Chinese history here in the history department. Um, and today I'm delighted uh, to welcome Professor Kovel Maiskins, who will be delivering a talk titled uh, Mao's Massive Military Industrial Campaign to defend Cold War China. Uh, Kovel Maiskins is an assistant professor of Chinese history in the National Security Affairs Department uh, at the Naval Postgraduate School. His book, first book, which is what we will hear about uh, today, is titled Mao's Third Front, Militarization of Cold War China, and it was published earlier this year by Cambridge University Press. Uh, as you can tell from, from the subject of his first book, Kovel's research centers on capitalist and anti-capitalist development in modern China, uh, with a particular focus on uh, large-scale infrastructure projects. And very much in keeping with that interest, he's working now on a, on a second book, uh, which, is the history, which is a history of perhaps the, the biggest infrastructure project of them all, uh, the Three Gorges Dam. Uh, and this project, uh, as of now, is titled uh, The Three Gorges Dam, Building a Hydraulic Engine for China. Uh, well, he's still keeping busy beyond that. He's also got a third project that he's working on, and this one, I think, aligns rather well with uh, his home department because it's uh, a history of the changing conceptions of national security in modern China. So very much in keeping with sort of security concerns and, and military concerns. Uh, in addition, Covell has written on topics as diverse as Chinese railroads, uh, the Three Gorges Dam, as we just mentioned, Sino-North Korean relations, Maoist visual culture, globalization, uh, radio in Mao's China, uh, and racial violence in the Pacific War. So a really, really diverse set of, uh, set of publications. Uh, but I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, the, in some ways, uh, the most uh, interesting part of Covell's academic profile, which is that he's also an amazing curator of uh, images, videos, and other kinds of paraphernalia from the Mao era. He curates a website known as Everyday Life in Mao's China. It's an ever-growing repository, and if you haven't had the chance to visit it, I would highly encourage you uh, to check it out. Um, so uh, before I hand things over to Covell, uh, just a few words about format. Uh, Covell will speak for about 30 to 35 minutes, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A session for roughly uh, the same length of time. Uh, so we'll try and finish by about 5.15 or 5.30. If you have questions, uh, please use the Q&A function uh, within Zoom to type them up. Uh, you are free to start uh, in asking questions during the talk itself, uh, and we keep track. Um, if um, uh, it, would, it would ideally, uh, I would request that you identify yourself as you type your questions to start with, with your ID. But at the same time, uh, we recognize that uh, because this, this talk is being recorded, some people may not be comfortable with that. So again, it's perfectly fine if you wish to stay, stay anonymous. Um, okay, so that's it. Without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Covell. Over to you. All right, thanks a lot, Arnab, and uh, thanks for the Fairbank Center for organizing this event. So today I'm going to be talking about what was probably the biggest uh, campaign in, uh, let me just get the, the uh, stuff lined up with the PowerPoint here. All right, that looks fine. Yep. All right, so today what I'm going to be talking about is the biggest campaign in Mao's China, uh, which really nobody knows about, um, and that's this massive military industrial campaign called the Third Front. So on May 27th, 1964, Mao Zedong, Song, Deng Xiaoping, Zhou Enlai, and a few other Chinese Communist Party leaders discussed China's third five-year plan. Over the past few months, Deng and other leading officials had drafted initial plans which concentrated on developing coastal areas and lifting the output of agriculture and consumer goods. Mao disapproved of this economic strategy because it did not address China's worsening city political environment. The United States had a string of military bases around China from South Korea to the Philippines, Washington was expanding its forward deployed forces in Southeast Asia. The Soviet Union, meanwhile, had transformed in the wake of the Sino-Soviet split from a close ally into a major security threat with 200,000 troops on China's northern border. What made matters worse was that both the United States and the Soviet Union had thousands of nuclear weapons, while China did not even have a single atomic bomb, as the Soviet Union withdrew its promise to help China to build one. Given China's imperiled international security position, Mao argued that, quote, in the age of the atom bomb, not having a military rear was no good, end quote. In preparation for war, the party had to divide the country into three military fronts, a first front along the coast in the Northeast and in the far West, as you can see in the map here on the left, 
a second front behind coastal provinces, and a third front in central China. In this final region, the party had to secretly build a large military industrial complex called the Big Third Front to serve as a backup economic motor for national defense in case the Americans or Soviets invaded, and the party had to abandon established industrial areas and retreat into the interior like Chiang Kai-shek had done during World War II, and then also like Stalin had done is another place that was taken as an example um, with Stalin's retreat from the Nazis during World War II. Provinces in the first and second front also had to build small industrial bases. So you can see over here in the, in the image on the right, these are all of the small third front uh, complexes that I've found to date. I'm sure that there are more, but these are all the, the, all the little dots that are on that map there, the ones that I've found uh, so far. Like the CCP's revolutionary base areas, all third front projects had to be dispersed in mountain, uh, mountain locations. With this new industrial war machine, Beijing would be in better position to fight off an assault by its Cold War enemies. Between 1964 and 1980, China dedicated about 40% of the national construction budget to building this arsenal of Chinese socialism, all while keeping the project completely secret because like other Cold War statesmen exposed to the heat of intense geopolitical friction, Chinese leaders presumed that whatever was publicly perceptible was militarily honorable. There's much that can be said about the Third Front. Today, I will concentrate my talk on a few major issues. First, I'll examine what party leaders initially thought of Mao's proposal to launch the Third Front. Next, I'll discuss CCB efforts to socially engineer a new Maoist person that embraced an austere life of hard work, quit building socialism before family concerns, and took wherever the party sent them to be their home. I'll assess what the builders of the Third Front made of Maoist standards of conduct by first looking at how the party mobilized later, labor and how people responded to recruitment. Then I'll go over the different meanings that people ascribe to the Spartan conditions of everyday life at the Third Front. Finally, I'll close my talk with a few comments about the Third Front's social, economic, and political afterlives. When Mao first proposed building the Third Front in May 1964 in China's inland regions, Deng Xiaoping and other top party leaders did not immediately back Mao's call to undertake a big developmental drive to bolster national security. They instead recommended conducting preparatory surveys, surveys and drawing up plans for a few select projects. This policy stance was based on the preference for focusing on coastal development, agriculture and light industry, as well as their concern that Mao was seeking to launch an industrial campaign like the Great Leap Forward. During the Great Leap, the central government had decentralized authority localities and commanded them to mass mobilize local resources to quickly expand China's industrial base. In the end, the Great Leap had led to economic and administrative disorder and a famine that killed tens of millions. The party elites only endorsed building the Third Front in August 1964 when the United States bombarded North Vietnam in the wake of the Tonkin Gulf incident. Faced with the prospect of a great power war, party leaders greenlighted, greenlighted construction of a military industrial complex in inland regions to ensure that the Third Front campaign did not experience the Great Leap Forward's managerial problems. Party leaders granted central planners sole authority over its administration, did not allow local leaders to independently initiate projects, and repeatedly reminded areas with different projects to pay due attention to agricultural production. Integral to the Third Front's construction was a massive labor force. In total, roughly 15 million people took part in the campaign, with about 1 million laborers coming from urban areas, and another 14 million be mobilized from the countryside. Since the Third Front was top secret, its creation was never officially announced. It was only through reading classified party documents that officials became aware of its existence. In late 1964, leading party organs began to send out documents about the Third Front, commanding provincial and municipal officials to help establish a powerful strategic fear and transform the unreasonable industrial imbalance between coastal and inland areas. Provincial and municipal officials then ordered individual work units to hold meetings and urge laborers to enthusiastically throw themselves into the battle of independent construction and think of the interior as their home. According to Shanghai propaganda guidelines, recruits were now we're told that China's industrial battlefront had entered a new stage of development, the period of adjustment after the Great Leap was over, and industrial and agriculture production was surging ahead. And yet China's industrial layout was unreasonable because imperialism had concentrated industry on the coast. The Third Front supposedly fixed this problem by industrializing the interior. Since Shanghai was one of China's most important industrial bases, it had the responsibility to fully support in the construction, Developed in the interior was also necessary because American imperialism was incessantly plotting to overthrow China's and socialist system and stage a capitalist restoration. Different recruits had to carry forward the revolutionary tr tradition of being ready to realize one's aspirations anywhere in the country. People might be reluctant to leave family, but which of China's revolutionary martyrs did not have parents, a wife, or kids? Now our country is like one big family, and each individual ought to ardently love our big families 
revolutionary mission and struggle to build up our country. Before someone was transferred to a third front project, a political background check was conducted to ensure that they were not classified as a landlord, rich peasant, counter-revolutionary, or rightist, and that they did not have any foreign contacts or personal reasons to oppose the Communist Party. The CCP instituted these recruitment criteria because it sought to only list people that could be trusted to remain dedicated to third front construction amid hardships, and it would not disclose its existence to domestic or foreign enemies. With this framing, the Communist Party presented third front participation as a political privilege. Some participants were excited to have this opportunity to link their personal lives to the larger political project of strengthening China's industrial fences and going where the party leadership thought they were most needed. Some participants' enthusiasm was heightened by Mao's declaration that until the third front was built, he would not sleep well. This was a phrase that appeared all, of, all over party documents. It was something that was, as we, that was repeatedly said in mobilization meetings. And then when, later on, when we'll get to the stuff of actually building the third front, this is this phrase of Mao not sleeping well unless the third front is built is something, is, is a phrase that becomes sort of a mantra for the, for, for the whole larger project. Favorable views of this sort were more common among youth who had grown up after the establishment of the People's Republic in 1949 and party members whose personal biographies were already deeply enmeshed with the CCP's project of building and defending socialism in China. Longtime party member and vice director of the Southwest Third Front Commission, Chen Zihua, thought that preparing for was absolutely necessary because America had launched a war of aggression against Vietnam and the Soviet border was very tense. In addition, the Third Front helped rectify the lack of industry in the interior. Chen viewed the building the Third Front as part of his lifelong mission of constructing Chinese socialism. Chung's long revolutionary career is evident in 1964 speech in which he called on his fellow Third Front administrators to remember when during the war of resistance against Japan, we pulled out of Vietnam and endured lots of difficulties. The Third Front requ required the same spirit that the party had then. Chung's career as an administrator is also on display in his 1964 speech where Chung treats the Third Front as a technical matter of correct bureaucratic structures and procedures. And he describes redesigning the economic matrix of Southwest China and relocating hundreds of thousands of people as administrative tasks. According to Chung, one task all party leaders were committed to was not squeezing agriculture like they had during the Great Leap Forward. As for rank and file recruits, many were traumatized when they learned that they had been chosen to answer Mao's order to firm up national security by industrializing remote mountainous areas. Urban residents were particularly distressed since going to the preferred front amounted to a socioeconomic step down when people, some people heard about relocation, they didn't eat and couldn't sleep. Other people cried, other people complained to their bosses. Instead of living in a city in which China's industrial, in China's industrial heartland, they would have to reside not only just in the underdeveloped interior, but they would also have to live in its mountainous hinterlands. Workers were anxious about the sort of life that awaited them in this industrial world that they would have to build themselves. Questions raised to their minds at a frenetic pace about their own and families on uncertain future. What sort of housing, medical facilities, and cultural activities were there to get the third front? Would there be schools for their children? And if there were, would they be any good? What would the local leather and food be like? Would they be able to adapt? Would they be able to understand the local dialect? Or would they feel left, be less feeling lost in translation? And most improb importantly, probably, when would they be able to come back and see their family and friends? Administrators charged with overseeing the relocation of urban workers had their own concerns too. Some provincial officials shared the worry of those in the party center who thought that the Third Front might nakedly impact the countryside like the Great Leap had. And so they stressed that the campaign must be centrally directed and that agriculture must receive adequate consideration. Some Northeastern and coastal officials also cautioned against ignoring the development of the regions and devoting too much attention to the interior. While some inland provincial officials voiced similar words of warning, others sought to acquire more industrial resources from developed parts of the country to advance local industrialization. Officials in rural areas also tended to view the Third Front more positively because it was a way for them to gain more resources by temporarily hiring labor out to projects in their vicinity. Employed in this way, a worker could earn about 32 yen per month. A laborer's wage, however, did not go directly into their pocket. The rural unit first took a portion to cover the cost of food and lodging. Workers received the remainder, which was about 6 yuan. So the sum was a significant material benefit for rural folk who typically were compensated in work points and earned on average 11 to 15 yuan per year. Mm -hmm. The amount that rural officials skimmed off the top was also more than they, they usually spent on local labor's livelihood, meaning that they too earned ex, uh, extra funding and had an incentive to, to mobilize people for these big projects. 
Small number of rural residents hired as permanent employees accrue the even greater privilege of having access to the broad welfare guarantees of an urban state-owned enterprise. Despite these material advantages, some rural parents were still reluctant to let their children partake in the third front because they preferred to have more familial labor for their household, could not prepare, bear to part with their loved ones, and feared that they might be maimed or killed in an accident. As this overview of people's responses to the third front recruitment demonstrates, how people thought and felt about being integrated into China's covert Cold War industrial defense apparatus was shaped by their specific social, economic, and geographical situation. When it comes to Shanghai officials, there are at least two minds about sending local labor to the Third Front. The municipal committee declared that whatever the Third Front needs, we should move. Shanghai's vice mayor was more reserved. In a letter to the State Planning Commission, he cautioned against not fully using the Third Front he especially disagreed with the new policy of not approving any new things being done in the first front since developing the coast would increase labor productivity, lower costs, and raise profits. It's likely that officials in other big coastal and northeastern cities viewed mobilizing local labor for the third front with similar ambivalence. For urban residents, their departure for the third front was often filled with tears. Leading cadres tried to stimulate enthusiasm by playing revolutionary songs and coming to the train station to wish them farewell. These efforts at solicitude were only were usually of little avail as family members and workers both welled up at not knowing when, if ever, they would see each other again. The hundreds to, to thousands of kilometers they had to travel before arriving at their destination reinforced the feeling of how far from home they were going. Their sense of heading out into the middle of nowhere was further enhanced by the fact that their future workplace was usually only reached by by trucks that had to snake for hours, if not days, up dusty mountain roads. Although rural folk generally had to travel shorter distances, they really had the luxury of motorized transport and had to instead walk for tens to hundreds of kilometers along rugged mountain routes. Upon reaching their new workplace, many recruits were shocked to find that not an established factory, but a construction site in various stages of completion. Due to shortages of motor vehicles, recruits regularly had to install heavy machinery by hand and lug in literally tons of supplies on shoulder poles and push carts. Whatever sort of work people were engaged in, it was militarized. People were organized into military units. Administrators described project goals as battles and trying to struggle against the United States and Soviet Union. Militaristic language and routines pervaded everyday life from calling colleagues, cadres, comrades in arms to a regimented work scale of morning Catholic Senex, long work hours, and regular readings of Mao's works about the need to have a military mindset. To reach the new th third front town of Panjihua, recruits took a five day ride in the back of trucks up into the soaring peaks of Southern Sichuan, camping at night along dusty roadsides. Upon arriving in town, people were assigned to labor brigades charged with building Panjihua's industrial infrastructure. One labor brigade was assigned to excavate by hand a 12 meter high boulder. To motivate workers, propaganda teams played songs and staged performances about locals working for days on end so that the Third Front was built and Chairman Mao slept well. In 1966, Vice Premier Peng Zhen came to Panjihua and warned that people cannot always work and must be allowed to sleep eight hours. There he also exalted local truck drivers whose habit of not sleeping and eating to get equipment quickly into town exemplified the will to seize the work that Peng had cautioned against. Local officials also talked to Peng's visit as reason to use the fastest pace to complete the mission Chairman Mao has given us. After work, the earliest recruits were lucky if they slept in tents on thin mats, as many closed their eyes under the stars with no bedding at all. Even with laborers erected, when laborers erected housing, it typically consisted of a thatched hut made of from rammed earth, provisions were similarly spartan with water scoured from local streams, and rice porridge and pickled vegetables being the main source of sustenance. Fresh vegetables occasionally added as an accompaniment and small morsels of meat only served about once a month. This regime of austerity was by design, resulting from the party's policy of restraining consumption so that more resources were available for expanding Chinese heavy industrial infrastructure and increasing its output. Workers in Panjahua came up with a jingle to sum up the resultant austerity of everyday Maoism. During the daytime, steel bars pressed down on our shoulders and at night we pressed down on hard beds. Another dog roll that workers came up with to describe their daily routine was, during the daytime is a barrel of laughs, at night we miss home. It's a rather sardonic dog roll that they came up with. Third front officials were aware of worker discontent, and so they made sure that participants were provided with a steady diet of films. 
They also distributed musical instruments and organized cultural performances and sporting events. One reason that Third Front administrators paid attention to local cultural life was the labor force was predominantly male. This demographic fact meant that for many singles, an assignment to the Third Front was a long-term sentence to celibacy. When interviewees discussed the Third Front's gender imbalance, they stated that one consequence was sexual violence. In interviewees, people talked about the hardships of Third Front life in many different ways, but there was a clear split in perspectives along the urban-rural divide. People from rural areas generally thought that the Third Front was better than the countryside, since as a state of, state of enterprise uh, employees, they had higher wages and access to welfare benefits. Urban recruits, on the other hand, sometimes said they had no choice but to stay, since if they left, they would lose their membership in an urban work unit and its associated welfare guarantees. Although many urbanites wished they could leave, have lived elsewhere, some also noted that their hardships had paid off. For years, they had engaged in physically demanding tasks, and in the end, they had industrialized a wasteland. There were projects that get completely abandoned, but I didn't interview these people, so there were places that get completely abandoned, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Other laborers worked hard because they enjoyed putting use to their technical abilities. One university graduate was dissatisfied when he was assigned to a construction team. Later, he found a sense of self-worth as a manager at a chemical factory. Another university graduate was assigned to a coal mine. From his, his experience, he had not developed the devout attachment to socialism. He had learned instead that there was no difference between socialism and Buddhism because socialism provided people with so little that they came to accept that it was pointless to want anything. Despite this dire, his dire realism, this man, like many others, enjoyed free movie screenings almost every night. Yet many people still thought life at the third front was dull. Some people found it especially tedious constantly studying Mao's speeches, which one interviewee compared to, the bland, to their bland diet of steamed buns and dried turnip stew. Some work units tried to deal with the monotony of daily life by increasing film showings and holding sports competitions. Nonetheless, many interviewees still complained that the third front life was boring. A comment that has led me to come up with a dry joke that building socialism was boring. What many people wanted was family far away. At first, some projects only allowed urban family members to move to nearby villages so that material resources could be concentrated under industrial construction. Where that family separation was a pressing issue, the CCB permitted 12 days of paid leave per year. This policy impact was significant. For example, at Panjoa Steel, on any given day, around a tenth of employees were on vacation. Administrators wanted laborers to spend more time at work, and so it relocated rural families to factory-run farms, provided service sector jobs for urban families. To handle this influx of worker kin, Panjoa Steel constructed new brick buildings and more tents and mud huts. Better housing did not change much the conjugal life of single rural men, since most single women came from cities and did not want to marry a country bumpkin. Mm -hmm. Families had other worries too. Many parents worried <clears throat> that poor schools would cripple their child children's life trajectory, and so parents helped run local schools. Even though the CCP suspended university exams for most of the 1970s, some parents still dreamed that their children might be able to go to college in a less insular part of China to go back to some big city. Urbanites who sacrificed their own biography to fortify Cold War China's military industrial ramparts, but they did not want to also give their children's lives to the Third Front. To assess the afterlives of the Third Front, it is necessary to examine this issue from several different angles. If this topic is approached from the perspective of the workers themselves, the picture is decidedly ambivalent. While Third Front workers regularly recognized in their memoirs and oral interviews that their years of hard work endowed inland China with a larger industrial base, they also often complain about the material privation of their everyday lives and the psychological adversity of being separated from family and friends. Even if family members accompanied recruits, they frequently worried that their works unit subpar schools would adversely impact their children's life chances, perhaps even make their progeny suffer the same bureaucratic fate as themselves and have to reside forever in China's mountainous backwoods. If a distant perspective is adopted and the third front is evaluated from the lens of its economic revolts, they are unmistakably, they too are unmistakably mixed. From one perspective, the third front made significant contributions to the development of inland China. China. By building up regional industrial infrastructure, the third front integrated inland regions more into the Chinese economy, sped up the circulation of regional resources, and augmented manufacturing, mining, and power facilities they made a society fueled by hydrocarbons and electricity into more of a norm in inland China. Taken all together, these economic changes helped to decrease the economic gap between the coast and the interior. 
On the other hand, the also established industrial base whose continued growth would require ever more resources whose development would place ever more stress on China's ecology. From another standpoint, the third front was massively wasteful. According to a 1984 state council report, only 48% of all projects were worthy of further development. The other third, 52% were abandoned. This is a stunning test testament of how much of the third front passed into the dustbin of Chinese economic history. However, when considering the inefficiency of the third front, is it important to take into account the security logic that's embedded in its construction? According to party policy, third front projects had to be in secluded areas and secluded mountains to put them out of the sight of enemy bombers. About a quarter of funding was also invested in factories that manufactured war material. The projects were rushed because of concerns that the Soviet Union and the United States might soon execute a major attack. The policy of quickening the building process ironically slowed down project completion as it resulted in shoddy construction and the need for years of repairs, which in turn raised building costs. Given the Third Front's many economic problems, it might seem most appropriate to conclude that despite what it left in terms of industrial infrastructure, it must overall be viewed as an economic failure. This viewpoint, however, overlooks the fact that the Third Front was a development initiative which placed ensuring national defense as the top priority. Critics might still object that although certain inefficiencies are expected for an industrial defense project, the CCP leadership nonetheless still overreacted to Soviet and American military pressures by investing so much in the Third Front and that the party could have guaranteed China's security with a more moderate industrial campaign. Perhaps the Third Front was too much, but stopping our analysis there neglects to take on board one particularly important point. The Third Front was not an isolated phenomenon. It was part of a slew of defense initiatives undertaken by Washington and Moscow during the Cold War, from the thousands of atomic bombs produced that if used would have annihilated life on Earth many times over, to the very long, bloody, and costly wars fought in Vietnam and Afghanistan. From this standpoint, the excessiveness of the Third Front appears not as a Chinese anomaly, but rather as part and parcel of the rationality of great power competition during the, great, during the Cold War. When massive reactions to perceived national security threats became a defining feature of international statecraft. This is a point especially worth remembering today as talk of a new Cold War between China and the United States is becoming more and more normal every single day. So thank you all for listening and I look forward to your comments and questions. Great, thanks so much, Pavel. Uh, we already have uh, a few questions lined up and I expect there'll be many more. But before we dive into them, I thought maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, one, one particular thing that I was thinking of as I was listening to you. Uh, do you, I know you conducted over 100 uh, oral history interviews as part of the research um, that you did. Um, did you notice uh, any kind of difference between the memories of the people who, uh, you know, were essentially ordered from from the, from coastal China, from the first front, as it were, to the third front? Uh, were, were those memories different from people who were originally in these third front regions, right? So who were locals essentially, who then may have been co-opted. And uh, are there different memories? Are there different ways in which they think about what happened? Um, and to what extent might, might that distinction be important? Well, I think that the big difference there is really between if you came from a big city or if you came uh, from uh, a rural area. So people who came from around, so if, imagine you're in a rural county. All of a sudden, the Ministry of Steel decides to set up a steel factory in your county. There's going to be complaints about losing land. You want to make sure you get compensated for the land correctly. You want to make sure that resources aren't going to be, you know, water, other things, uh, graves, other th things that the, the, the community thinks important aren't damaged. Uh, but overall, the people are going to, uh, they develop sort of two different relationships. One is it, it, it's sort of a hate loves thing. They, they want to get inside the factory. They would prefer to have, they would, they, a lot, there's a lot of memoirs about people wanting their kids or one of their family, uh, themselves to be able to get a position in the state of an enterprise. But then there's also sort of a hatred towards them because of the advantages that they have, because it's, it's such a stark uh, divide between the, the work unit, which in often cases were walled up uh, and they, which have hospitals, which have cinemas, which have you know their own, uh, not just hospitals, but sometimes they had um, uh, uh, ambulances and they had actual doctors that they shipped in from Shanghai. And then right across the, outside the wall, there's, you know, you, you, you depend on whatever, whatever the local resources are because, it, because of the self-reliance policies that the party had in place. Um, so that's really where the start divide is. When I talk to people um, who were sent from Chongqing or people who were sent from Chengdu, 
uh, or people who are French from Xi'an, their, their memories are similar to what you get on the, on the coast, people who are sent from the coast. And that it's it, the really big divide is, is being sent from the provincial capital to the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, or being sent from Shanghai to the middle of nowhere versus being li living around the factory. Uh, and usually what are places that you wouldn't normally have anything there because you, you don't usually think of building heavy industry into a mountainside unless there's a mine there, right? Right, but right. There's a dam, yeah. you know, you're going to build there. So. Right. Yeah. So, so it's interesting. So the, the real the real divide actually is a, is a much more sort of pervasive divide, which is the urban rural one that you're finding here also. Well, yeah. Pervasive I mean, in, in 20th century sort of developments, broadly speaking. Okay. So we've we've got a lot lot of questions. So I think we should dive into them. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just read them out. Uh, but I think you can you can read them too uh, as you go along. So in case you need to to refer to them, but I'm going to read them out for for our audience also. So the first one is from uh, Trevor Jones, uh, who researches the Chinese defense industry at the Wisconsin Project on Arms Control in DC. Mm -hmm. And he's asking, he says, Thank, uh, thanks for taking the time to talk today. I'm curious about uh, what lessons you think contemporary Chinese leaders have taken from Mao's Third Front campaign. And how have these lessons impacted the way Chinese leaders approach encouraging military civil fusion, which is in quotes, uh, and managing today's Chinese defense industry? Okay. Um, let me, I had one last slide about your first question. So I think oh, that sorry, there is a I, I, I interrupted sorry. You. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll get to this, this next question. Um, the, I think that there is a device, there is still is one the way that you can see the coastal versus interior difference. It does matter in that people when they're from the coast. So if they're coming from Beijing, they're coming from Shanghai, uh, they're coming from Guangzhou. The way they talk about the inland areas is it's completely like a foreign country. They imagine like it's it's some sort of jungle land where it's, it's completely uncivilized, um, uh, which I think a lot of people just aren't aware of this. And you, you still get this sometimes in China today where people talk about the interior and it sounds like they're talking about, you know, a scene out of an Indiana Jones movie or something. Um, so I think there still is that divide where you wouldn't get that from people who are in Chengdu or Chongqing. They still have this idea that the mountains are uncivilized to a degree. Uh, but it's it's different than the whole interior is 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 less developed, um, and just doesn't have culture, um, mm -hmm. you know, male and hua. So, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what the party has learned from the Third Front, um, it, it, it it's been a complex learning process. So initially, the party did not like it. So in the eight in the eighties, what happens is that there's a real renunciation of the Third Front, and it's it's it, it's it's portrayed portrayed as a, a failure. Um, so in the in the early 80s, when they have the discussions about how they're going to talk about the Mao period, there was a discussion of, of including the Third Front in, the, in the, the statement that they make about the history of the Maoist period, but they decide not to put it in there. And so uh, it, it's late 1970, you start to see, uh, uh, it, it appears in newspapers, because before it didn't even exist. Uh, late, late, nine, late 80s, it starts to appear more in newspapers. There starts to be public talks about it. Um, and it, but it's not really until the um, late 90s when it gets reevaluated in a positive way. And the reason it gets revalidated in a positive way is because it starts to become the party becomes concerned about the emerging inequalities of, uh, the, of, of the reform period. And so it's partly about all these workers who are losing their jobs. Uh, it's also about the, the, the concern between the coast and the interior again, and this emerging divide that's getting bigger. And so, with you get with with the, uh, the opening of the West campaign, so she got she would die the late '90s. The Third Front gets reevaluated and gets evaluated as being something positive, uh, because it's it's portrayed as being part of the longer history of the party's commitment to overcoming the coastal interior divide. Um, it's gotten reevaluated again uh, with the start of the the, the Belt and Road campaign. And that it's once again a part of this longer history of the party's commitment to sort of having a flat development across the country, or at least more equitable uh, distribution of resources in, in China. Uh, but now it's different, and that uh, before the the third front, or not the third front, but the interior was usually conceived as making it more integrated with the nation. It's usually what it was about, and it, making it so that there's less divide between the coast and the interior. But with the BRI, it's really much more about making it so that the West is connected to Central Asia, it's connected to South Asia, connected to Southeast Asia. Um, and so it, 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 they're, they're, they're still, it, it, it's been 
carved into this, this, this it's been reevaluated many different times. Um, now, if you look at what the party's learning in terms of the, the, the defense industry stuff, uh, some of the stuff is still there. So the, uh, there was a, a few years ago, there was a guy, I can't remember where he was at, at Georgetown, who discovered all of these underground tunnels that the US, that, that China was had all these nuclear weapons in. And it was, it was one of the things that made people think that, oh, China has way more nuclear weapons than they say they do. They, you know, they officially, I think, have 300, but people in the Pentagon elsewhere imagine they have a lot more and say, oh, there's all these tunnels. This must mean that they had, there's, there's stuff that they're hiding. At least for the, I wasn't part of that conversation because that was before I wrote this book, but, but from my colleagues I've heard is people are like, uh, uh, yes, we knew there were these tunnels here. This, this is stuff that was, you know, the, the third front has, you built stuff underground everywhere. I mean, if you go to a Chinese city now, you see uh, all these underground markets are leftovers of, of the third front or of just the, the concerns about air raids that, that get really ramped up in the, in the 60s in, in China. Um, I think that the other thing that the party could have learned in terms of uh, what, what they learned from the third front is just one of the biggest legacies of this is that just the will, to desire, and building the capacity to carry out massive industrial projects, massive industrial infrastructure projects. For me, I don't want to completely swallow this, the, the party story that the third front is part of this sort of pre-programmed idea of the party is going to save the West and develop the country. But it is part of this long-term uh, endeavor of the party of just having a commitment to uh, the Communist Party, but then also the KMT as well, uh, of just having, what is it to be a good nationalist uh, or, or socialist uh, government for, the, for a modern Chinese leader? It often is involved building these big industrial projects that are going to transform the economic geography of whole regions. And for the latter half of, of, the, uh, of the Mao period, this is the third front. And people don't know about the third front, but this is what the third front was. And you can see this continuing onwards afterwards. So you see this with the, um, the, the special economic zones. So a lot of people like to think of the special economic zones as the sort of private uh, industry. But if you, actually, it's not. The, the, government, the, the hand of the government is there. And, and also some of the people who are building this stuff as government organizations. Um, and it's, so you can see this will also just being carried on with the Shiva Dakai Fa, with the Opening West campaign, and then through through the Belt and Road Initiative. So I think that partially answers this question. But not that we could talk about this more. If it's it comes interesting up. Though, connected to to SEZs and and other sort of major major projects in more recent years. Uh, okay, we have a, a, a really interesting question from from Mark Matten uh, from the University of Erlangen, who asks uh, how much were the workers exposed to science education. Uh, that is the the Kershu of Huji Yundong. Uh, so, did knowledge transfer play any role in their labor? And then he has a follow up. If if it did, what kinds of related journals were av available uh, in the third front? Okay, I somewhat don't know the answer to that question, um, and that I haven't. Um, there was one. There was a couple places that I went to and tried to get a more sense of what was happening locally. Uh, I, I tried to do this in this mostly at the city of, of Pantahua. Uh, I spent about a month trying to get into various archives. Initially, when I went there, it was they rolled out the red carpet. They're like, "Oh, you can get into the Pantahua Steel Archive. You can get into all this stuff, and you can talk to all the leaders." But then something happened, and I'm pretty sure it's somebody realized that talking to a foreigner was bad for their career, possibly, <laughs> and they decided, "Oh no, you can't do anything. Nobody, everybody who's your contact, they, he told them that uh, my contact there told all these people not to talk to me anymore." Uh, the archivist said, you know, go get some letters. I got the letters and they said, no, go away eventually. But in any case, I couldn't get as much granularity because of just uh, sort of security concerns of local people. And so I couldn't get a sense of what sort of journals there were that were circulating uh, at, at that level. What you do see, and this, this comes out in the, in the book, is there is a very specific Maoist way of doing science. Um, and uh, at least in the way that I talk about it in the book, it's not completely disastrous, but there's a fair amount of disaster that goes on, especially uh, once you get into uh, to sort of 67, late 66, 67 forward. And that what happens is that elite knowledge gets classified as being bourgeois or being classified as, as, as revisionist. And so 
what this means is that people who are who are perceived as having foreign knowledge, bookish knowledge, or capitalist knowledge, they're they're going to be constantly questioned. Um, and so, what what is what does this mean concretely? What is bourgeois knowledge? So you can see reports where going slow, not building things quickly, is is bourgeois. Waiting for cement and not just using local dirt to build. Uh, part of a railroad bridge. That's bourgeois. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to wait for tools or wait for machinery to build stuff. This gets classified as being bourgeois or, or revisionist. And so what this leads to is a lot of projects that get built very quickly, but, and there are textile experts often around, but they're, 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 their views get sidelined. And this leads to a lot of, of, of problems. Um, and because what's on the other side, what's getting, what, what's getting uh, valued is local knowledge, local resources, uh, local self-sufficiency. Uh, and so uh, there's mass mobilization of people to come up with ingenu ingenuitive ways to build a bridge using less cement. It's, in some cases, this works. In other cases, you know, you can't build, that's sort of what, one of the cases that comes up in the book is they try to build the Three Gorges Dam. And, and you just can't, it, it, one of the problems that they have is that they, all the experts are sitting around saying, you can't just keep pouring cement. You've got to let the cement cool because when cement, because if the cement, when it cools, it expands. If you just keep pouring cement, you're going to get it so that you're going to get cracks because, and you're also going to start getting holes in the dam. And lo and behold, what happens? Exactly that. <laughs> so, I mean, there's some cases where it works, but there's other cases where, uh, where they really try to speed things up and it, it, it doesn't work out very well. That's that's really interesting, and uh, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because there's a related question. So maybe you know I'm going to try and curate this a little bit so that uh, so the conversation I think is perhaps more interesting to our, our, our um, participants also. Uh, so uh, Professor Bill Kirby uh, had had a question that talked that, that was related to sort of your sources and and your uh, the, your use of uh, local archival materials. So he he says fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, can you comment on your ability to use local archi archival materials in your research? So you, you started talking about that a little bit, so I thought it'd be great if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, so the book uses a whole different kinds of sources. So I tried to get into, um, as I mentioned before, the Pontypool archive. I looked at stuff for about an hour and then they told me, no, you can't look at stuff anymore. Um, uh, I was able to, and then the archivist told me to look for more stuff or get a, get a letter from the provincial government. I think he thought I wasn't gonna get the letter. I miraculously got this letter. <laughs> From, from the Weishaban. But then I came back and he said, I, I don't care what letter you get. I'm never gonna let you into the archive. So I was like, okay. <laughs> at least he was honest and he didn't make me go on a wild goose station anymore. Places that I were I was able to look at local archives was, was uh, Chongqing. At first they let me in uh, because of a contact. There eventually the contact told them what I was studying or they realized what the third front was because a lot of people don't know what it is even in China now. So initially when I went to China I said, oh, I studied the third front. People were like giving me access. I was like, oh, that's great. But then they started to realize, oh, this is a military industrial project. That's not good. This is national security stuff. And so Chongqing still would show me stuff. Um, and I went there a few times, but uh, they came up with the rule and, uh, that anything that said secret on it, uh, on, on the top of the document, they wouldn't show me anymore. Sometimes the archivists were not so careful and still showed stuff to me because they would just flip through the thing, you know, just looking to see if there was anything on the first page and then they would give it to me. Uh, uh, but it did make it so it was harder to get stuff. The places where I was really able to get more materials was uh, the Sichuan archive. So I spent a few, many months there, uh, and, but that was really sort of provincial level stuff. There was some central stuff and then also um, uh, some stuff from, from happening on the projects. And then the other thing was, uh, was Hubei, Hubei archive. But what I learned from the provincial archive and then also the, the, the uh, the Sichuan Provincial Archive and then the Hubei Provincial Archive is that I never talked about the Third Front anymore. I always said I was studying, uh, a guy in Chongqing told me to say, you study transportation. No, oh, there's a lot of stuff that we built. You know, we built lots of roads. So just say you study that. So I did that for it some places. I would say I worked on roads or I would say I worked on electricity or I worked, because the Third Front does all this stuff. Uh, Hubei at one point said, you said you worked on transportation, but you're looking at all this other stuff. What are you doing? And I was like, oh, you know, I'm interested in electricity too. And they didn't, you know, they, they were happy with that explanation. Um, the other thing that was helpful for me for getting uh, uh, more local sources, uh, archival sources at least, was um, 
in the last five, 10 years, there's been stuff that's been published. Uh, so there's, it's, it's, uh, there, there's, with the reevaluation of the third front is sort of being part of the party's grand project of developing the interior. There's been money that's flowed down for people to publish stuff. Uh, and sometimes this has meant local memoirs. Uh, so local party history office is producing memoirs, which has been helpful for me, but they've also published collections of documents. Uh, one of the things that was most helpful for, especially for the chapter that's on Pancho Hua, is uh, there's this big book that it's like 2000 pages or so, that's just documents. And it was meant for internal circulation. And I found it at a, um, at a uh, it was on Kung Fu, is where I got it from. Uh, and then the, the same thing happened for some other stuff where I haven't completely used those sources. So for those of the people who are, who are PRC historians, you'll know about the garbology stuff. So there was at one point where I found a, a construction company that I was able to track down was from Chengdu, but had been sent to a third front project to build stuff. I didn't know what, but I could, I figured out that this, this seller was selling kilos of stuff. I think I bought like five kilos of documents. Uh, I had no idea what was going to be in it. Um, and some of it was just provincial level stuff that had been sent to the sent to the work unit or the municipal level stuff that had been sent to the work unit, which wasn't that interesting because it was already heavily processed. Um, but then there was some other stuff that were more individual case files. Uh, those things didn't actually make it into the book, but um, I did find other sort of garbology type stuff at, at markets. And then uh, actually not on Kung Fu but more there was another website that used to be used to have good stuff, 99778. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they, they, they seem to have less stuff now. Right. So I just while we stay on this topic, because we've had a couple of uh, follow up questions. So I'll ask them now and then get back to some of the earlier ones. So Mark, Mark Martin has a follow up where he says, when did you visit the archives and did access change in the past few years? And Jed Schwartz uh, has a similar sort of question. He says, what approximate date were you doing this research? And when, as specifically as possible, did the attitudes of the Chinese authorities in this area change, as you have described? That is, when did they begin to shut you out? So sort of speak a little bit of the timing. So two things, uh, they shut me out with initially. <laughs> so, well, I went, I, I think I, the first time I went was in 2011. Uh, I, uh, uh, Jakob Eifert, I think said, uh, you've got to go to the archives and make sure you can get stuff before you try to do this project. So, you know, sort of pre-dissertation proposal. Um, I think that was the first time I went. And then I, I got a ton of stuff from Chongqing, but then as soon as they realized I was doing third front stuff, they, they clamped down because it's, it's just national security. And, and, and especially in a place like Chongqing, which still has a lot of military stuff in it, um, it, 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 it people are aware of, of the sensitivity of this stuff. Um, so when I, when, I, when I was in, I think 2012, 2013, uh, when I was in Sichuan and in Hubei, I didn't really have any problems there. It was, it was completely open, it was completely, um, there was some stuff that, that, that they, they wouldn't show me, I think, in, in, in Sichuan, but it wasn't really a major problem. Um, when I went back, I, I can't remember right now, I think it was in 2016 or 2017, like second or third year at my current job, uh, I went back to Sichuan and a lot of the Mulu had been taken off of the shelves. So originally, um, when I thought I was going to write just about Panchahua, I started looking at stuff for, for the Great Leap Forward, because it was also going to be built then. And there was, there was, there was these Mulu that had all this stuff about that. Um, uh, but when I went back and I don't know, it was 2017 or so, that nothing, those, those had just been taken off. And the way they explained it to me was they were digitizing everything. And so they, the, the stuff that they were digitizing that you, you just couldn't see anymore. Uh, and so I don't know what the situation is like now, because part of the problem that I have is um, very particular to my own particular job. And that since I work for the US military, that makes it complicated to access archives in China. So uh, I, I, the, just the short story is I've asked people in China who are contacts for letters and they'll say, no, because you work for the military. That's the short story. <laughs> so so I, my, my situation is, is complicated by Right, both sides complicated, of the yeah. security state. So, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, a question from Yanni Li, who says, "Hi, what is the impact of industrializing and building the third front in the inland regions on later developments of the region? So, post mar developments of inland China. So, you, you alluded to the Shibu Dakata already, but if you could um, speak." To yeah, I mean, I think that a useful way for understanding this is is sort of through two different lenses. One is 
people like to make fun of Sun Yat-sen sometimes or sort of say he had this crazy idea with his big industrial development plan. But I don't know exactly how he came up with the plan, but a lot of the things that he came up with eventually get built or people want to build for a long time. And so I think it's useful, uh, Judd Kingley's idea of, of a state layering, I think that this is often what happens. There's these sort of these big, uh, the, the, the big third front projects are things that some of them were in Sun Yat-sen's plan. A lot of them, the really big projects, so Panjahua, uh, uh, the, the, the Three Gorges Dam, so which turns into Gujoba, a lot of the railroad projects, these were things that were, they attempted during the Great Leap Forward. So at one point, I, I mentioned this in the book, um, that really, a lot of ways, the third front is the Great Leap Forward continued, except it's, it's still big scale, it's still monumental, but it's select big infrastructure projects instead. And so these, these get layered on over time. And so that what happens is that, um, especially mining, railroads, uh, big steel projects, uh, big car manufacturers, things like this, this sort of uh, weight, of industrial weight, it just gets, gets, gets built up more and more over time um, and through with, with the different projects. Um, so that's, that's one way of looking at it. There, there are others as well, uh, but I'll, I'll just leave it at that for now. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, there's, there's a question that again, I think uh, connects nicely to something you said earlier. This is from Professor Shalin Wu. Uh, and I think you talked earlier about how one of the experiences of people coming from the, uh, uh, the coast was that they, it felt like they were in a foreign country. Uh, and, and she's asking, uh, you place the third front in the spectrum of Cold War defensive measures from USSR to Washington, DC. What about the larger context of 20th century inner colonization and interior development schemes? So sort of to place it in dialogue with things like the TBA in the US and, and Magnitogorsk in the Soviet Union. And then she has a sort of follow-up later on, which I'll add right now itself. And she says, uh, were there any connections between the third front and the nuclear secret cities? That were also being built, and again, you alluded to the uh, the tunneling and the and, and so on. But, so uh, I heard I heard stuff about nuclear secret cities and then intercolonization. Sorry, the gardeners came to my house, so I couldn't I couldn't hear them in a portion of the question because there's a loud leaf blower in it. Oh, so should I, should I just read it out again, or? Yeah, can you just? Okay, sure. So, so so she says you place the third front in the spectrum of Cold War defensive measures from USSR to Washington D.C. What about the larger context of 20th century inner colonization and interior, and interior development schemes from uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority to Magnitogorsk? So from you know southern southern US to, uh, to, to the Union. And then she had that follow up about uh, um, you know connections, third front connections to nuclear nuclear cities. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can look at it both ways. So initially in the introduction to the book, I had a long section that sort of made the ties between the um, the, the 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 development schemes of the um the KMT uh, of trying to develop it also the late Qing that a lot of the interior devel uh, development that happens with the Qing is in inland regions and it's also partially for military reasons but originally the, the third front the, the introduction to my book had a much longer uh, historical section to it but that all got cut uh, and it, it ended up being much more uh, cold war focused um and it was partly just a matter of scope, but that also just uh, uh, your introduction can only be so long. Um, but yes, it's definitely part of this longer interior development uh, scheme. I mean, I was earlier sort of linking it more to the post Mao period, but you can definitely go backwards uh, as well. Um, and that it's uh, when the party is talking about what they're doing, uh, in the early discussions. So I have elite discussions. So for sort of 1964 to 1966, uh, there's a little bit for later on, but it's really 1964 to 66, it's become available uh, because of a guy who I, sh who I should mention, Chen Dongling, who's written the book in, in China, in Chinese uh, about the third front. Uh, he, he published a collection of documents that, that, and, and it gave me access to some other documents that, that made it so that uh, I could tell this story easier. Um, when they're talking about it then, they have a couple of things in mind. One of them is Chiang Kai-shek, definitely. They're thinking of what happened before in the Southwest uh, and just interior at large. They're also thinking about the Soviet Union. Uh, they're thinking about Stalin didn't, at least the way they tell the story is that Stalin didn't adequately prepare for World War II. And so, and he got you know caught with his tail between his legs and had to run away. Uh, and then the other thing that, that, that I've seen a little bit of mention of is, is the Korean War. 
Uh, and so this helps, I think, to I, I I've always wanted to find more about this because I suspect that there's more to it than 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 I can find in the sources. But they also talk about the Korean War. It's because of their, that's their experience of aerial warfare. And for the people who went to Korea, it's really just experience of we can't fight. We, we cannot fight against the U.S. Air Force. We just there's no there, it, it, we can't shoot down these planes that well. Um, and so, I mean, the, you, it, when you see from the memoirs of the of the railroad corps is the ones that I've read the most. It's, it's all about tunneling. It's all about going underground so that they, they, they can get away from the airplanes. Um, and so I think that the, they, they have this idea of the Korean War, that, which they talk about a, a little bit. Um, and I suspect that the impact is actually larger uh, because of that, that would have been their experience of, of, of air warfare. Um, for the nuclear secret cities, um, is there a link between them? There is a link. I have never looked. So I intentionally, when I went to look for sources, I intentionally made the decision that I would never look for anything that would be military. So I intentionally never asked about airplanes. I never asked about weapons. I never asked about nuclear stuff because I didn't want there to be any misperception about what I was doing. I didn't want anybody to think I was a spy and end up in prison basically. <laughs> so I never asked about this stuff. People, I would find stuff occasionally and I found, you know, I know, I know where this stuff is uh, and why it was there and sort of what happened with it, but I never intentionally went looking for it. And so, it was definitely part of the, so with the third front, what happens is that when they're building up the nuclear weapons, uh, when they're going about to test the bomb, what happens is that Joe and Lai says, um, I think it's in, um, uh, it's either late 1963, early 1960, I think it's J January 1964. He says that the nuclear industry needs to be dispersed. And he actually comes up with the phrase that's very, that's pretty much word for word, which becomes the third front motto. Motto is it needs to be near mountains, it needs to be dispersed, and it needs to uh, 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 potentially go underground. It needs to be, he doesn't actually, not the underground part, but the, it needs to be hidden. Initially, this was applied for the nuclear industry. And so this meant taking stuff out of the Northwest. And then if you, if you go to uh, China now, uh, and, and especially Sichuan, just it, the, the, the nuclear industry is all over the, the province. And this is because of that initial order. And so it gets, it, it, it's especially on the mountains on the, uh, the so the western part of the, the Chengdu Plain, if you go up into the mountains there, there's nuclear stuff all over the place there. Um, and, and, it, and a lot of it's still there. Um, so one way we can know this is because of the 2008 earthquake. One of the cities that, that, that they, they get hit hardest, they were all concerned because there was nuclear leaks because there was, there was underground nuclear stuff there. Um, so it's connected to the nuclear stuff, but it's not exactly the same thing. Um, it, it's, uh, but it's similar in that it is that they're also secret cities. These places didn't officially exist. Um, you know, the, the, if you had a, some of them really didn't exist in that Pontypa, there's no way you're going to go there because it's, it's way out in the middle, you know, even, if, you know, unless you take high speed train, it's 10, you know, it's 10 hours up on the, on the railroad, uh, even in, in the 2000s when, I, you know, 2010s when I went. Um, and so, but there's other things where like in Chengdu, you would have the Eastern portion of the city had a lot of third front factories, but you would have had to have special access cards to get into them and they would have all been secret. The other thing is that you, people got actually something called a Baomi Fei. So you got a subsidy for keeping secrets, uh, which is one thing that made it difficult to interview people because um, um, people were just concerned that what they were doing was possibly illegal. Even though if their factory had gone bankrupt uh, they, they'd had so much just sort of the security state mindset built into them that, that they, they, especially since I was a white guy, that, that honestly didn't help. And, and, and the, the other thing that didn't help was that um, you don't, you, this is changing now in China, but usually young people don't refer to you as Meidi, like as American imperialist. But when you meet, when I met old people, that was the way they would talk about me. Oh, you the American imperialist. I was like, which was which was obviously a little bit disarming at first, but it, I actually felt like it was kind of authentic because that's what the, that's the way that they would have Olympic, talked about the United Olympic, States. Yeah, yeah. That that would have been their reference. It wouldn't have been Megul. It would have been Maydi. So right, right. <laughs> that's 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 pretty interesting. Uh, next up, we have a question from Pete Braden, who is an Anwan postdoc at the Fairbank Center this year. He says, "Thank you for your talk. Considering that many coastal cities were able to build deep, spacious tunnels and caverns during the first, during and after the 1969 deep." dig deep shelters campaign. Why do you suppose the top leaders are keen to set up factories so far inland rather than simply hardening, concealing the existing facilities? So when they built stuff, when are you saying they built stuff? So this is, he says the, the 1969 dig deep shelters campaign, which is when they built a lot of uh, 
a lot of stuff in the city. So deep tunnels, spacious tunnels. Yeah. Uh, so why, why, why the why the push? I guess to so the the dig deep campaign. It, it is at least what I would view it as at it, it, sixty nine. Is that's part of the larger security concerns that propel the third front. So there's the, there's the public face of this, which is the building the the, the, the shelters in cities. Uh, but then there's also the, the hidden face of it, which is the third front, which is moving stuff inland. So a couple of reasons you would do this is one, I don't, I haven't seen party documents for elites talking, uh, you know, on digested stuff. There's memoirs, but on digested stuff, a whole lot for 6970. So I'm not exactly sure what the conversations are, but for earlier, it's because they're concerned about two, a couple of things. One is occupation. So the US, the Soviet Union could just bomb things which would be bad. And so they, they, wanted, they, want to, they want to move stuff, they want to move industry inland, partly for that reason, because they don't want it to just, they, they think it's harder to get to if it's in these hidden areas. Um, and then the other thing is that they could invade. They, they could invade and they could decide to occupy this area. And so if they're gonna occupy the area, have, hiding stuff underground in the first front is not gonna necessarily help. But the other thing that, to, to just add an extra layer to this is that, the economy of China in the night, late, sort of late 60s into early 70s is turned inside out to a degree. And that what happens is that it's not just you have key industrial projects put into the West, into the interior and into to central China. What you also have is, is that this happens for all provinces. So I had that map earlier for, for small third front projects. And that the idea was is that if you got invaded, you would have this big industrial reserve in the interior. But you would also, in every single province, have light arms manufacturers so they could carry out guerrilla war in every, in every province. And so it's, it's, it's all over the place. And so my suspicion, I'm not sure exactly where he's talking about, uh, but I know in Fujian they had this, they built lots of stuff underground, uh, but then they also had military, you know, third front, they had a small third front up in the mountains. So it's, it's sort of the visible in the, in the hidden face of, of sort of a similar process. Mm -hmm. Right, and it sort of it feeds into, I guess, also if you look at sort of military sort of strategy that Mao himself sort of valorized in terms of you know controlling the countryside, letting the cities be, cities be, and so on. So there's there's a genealogy there too, I guess. Um, so yeah, the, the next question. That, yeah, sorry, go ahead. For that, there definitely is another thing that was that I had long suspected, but I actually found proof of it at one point is that the small third front factories map on the base areas, hmm. and it's not clear if this happened in ten, if there was an order to do this or if the people were working towards the chairman, right? So there's a reports where, where uh, I think it's Laura Ching is, is, is saying, reporting about the small third front. And he says, these are all the places that people have found for the small third front. Uh, lo and behold, they're all in the areas where former base areas were. So it's not clear if local officials were like, okay, this is what would logically fit, or if they're trying to do it because they think this is what the leadership wants. It's probably a combination, but it, it actually does map on mm -hmm. uh, to, to the to the to the revolutionary very series in, in, in pretty striking. Right, that's that, that is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, okay, we still have a bunch of questions, so I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah, power sorry. ahead. Uh, no, 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 this is great. Uh, so the next question is from Xiang Li Ding uh, from the Rhode, Rhode Island School of Design. He has two questions, but I think the first, I'll, I'll, I'll read them both out, but I think the first you've already answered, so we'll, we, you can focus on the second. He says, thank you for your fascinating talk. I have two questions. In addition uh, to the Cold War context, have you found any connections between some of the third, uh, those third front projects uh, with nationalist government's reconstruction efforts during the 1940s? I think you've addressed this in some of your other comments. The second question, uh, which is close to my heart too, could you elaborate a little bit about the energy industry, in particular the hydropower industry in the third front campaign? Okay, uh, so on the connections with the KMT, there definitely is an overlap of some of the some of the projects uh, that, that are going to be built. Not all of them, though, because the CCP actually did control the whole country, and so they had a bigger canvas, they had a bigger landscape for for, for doing these sorts of projects um, than what, what what the KMT would have had. But there's definitely overlap between the two of them. Um, um, in terms of the relationship with the energy industry, um, so there's big investments in, in, in coal, really, and then hydropower as well. Uh, the, the, most of the hydropower dams that get built, it's sort of, there's, there's stuff, it's central China, northwest China, and then it's southwest China. Um, uh, it doesn't matter quite as much now because they're not in power anymore, but Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao both 
worked on third front projects when they were hydraulic engineers uh, it, 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 before, but nobody talks about them anymore because they're retired. <laughs> but but, but um, when I initially discovered that, that, that was exciting. But they, uh, for, for the energy projects, the, this is the stuff that I was mentioning before that really gathers weight. So there, there's, there's some mines that are opened up uh, in, in sort of central Shanxi is where they get opened up, but then they start going up and they don't completely go up into the north. And I think it's, I don't have the documents to prove this, but I think it's because the Soviets are there. So they don't go completely up into the north because they're worried about near Mongolia getting taken. But they, the way I look at it is they're sort of building foothold of the energy industry in sort of central Shanxi. And then the really big coal deposits are up in, in Shanbei and then up into inner Mongolia. This is where the really massive, you know, this is where the, the, the Shanxi coal mine boss comes from, is, is from that. Um, and so you can see that happen in other places too, where there's, there's building up of, of, of sort of these uh, mineral cities. For hydropower, this happens as well, but most of the hydropower projects, they're not quite as disastrous as Simon Shah, where the, they, they just completely become useless. I mean, there are some, but other ones, it's they build them really qu quickly, then there's problems, and then they have to fix them for most of the, 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 the 70s is, is sort of the normal pattern on that, is that they, they, there's a big rush uh, to build stuff for, for, for hydropower stuff in the but a 64 to 65 to 66. And then there's another one from 69 to 71. And they do get stuff built, uh, but there's a lot of problems then they have to fix them. And then they usually don't become completely operational until the end of, uh, of, uh, of the seventies. But um, yeah, the thing that I'm interested in looking at, which is, uh, I have a paper I'm gonna be working on over the next few months is how they build up capacity nonetheless. So even though there's all these problems for these projects at the same time, uh, as you show in your book with the training statisticians, I'm curious how that happens in the hydropower sector. Of how, how do how do you what does it look like for building hydraulic engineers? So you've seen this in your work. You see it with statisticians, with Elizabeth Cole's work. We can see this with railroad engineers. Yeah. I'm curious how it works. What does the Maoist period look like for building up just sort of basic capacity, knowledges, skills of, of of doing things with dams? At this point, I don't know. Maybe you know more. But that's something that I think. My suspicion is that there is, to respond to Mark uh, Matten's question earlier, my sense is that there probably was capacity that was built up, um, but I, I just haven't seen it in my sources for the third front, because with the third front, I'm looking at a big canvas. If I can zoom in on the hydropower engine, in, uh, industry, it makes it a lot more manageable to just learn about the hydropower engine, industry rather than learn about all industry, which is not feasible. <laughs> so. Right, right. Uh, Okay, uh, so uh, another question. Uh, this is from Jason Chan, who's at the University of Cambridge. He says, I wonder how you interpret the rhetoric, whether it is, uh, it is its long lasting legacy or in fact isolated conceptualization of Mao's three fronts in relation to more contemporary prioritization of certain economic regions. For example, where Deng's uh, let, uh, let part of the people get rich first um, in coastal areas in China's Western development a revival of the three fronts paradigm. Okay, I'm not sure that came across very clearly, but. So, I mean, I think that there, I mean, even with the dung stuff, it's eventually the idea that, that, that people, when they start the Shiba Jai stuff happens is that in dung, he says, we're going to get back to this later. You know, it's not completely, we're going to forget about the interior. Um, it's we're going to get back to this stuff later. And so at least with the Shiba Jai stuff, they, 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 you know, the opening West campaign, is there they say you know actually we're fulfilling what the you know our you know the great leader said we should do is we're, we're 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 doing this and we're doing it you know 20 years later um so um yeah but I, yeah i wasn't sure exactly what the question was yeah asking. okay let's uh, let's let's move on uh so we have another question from Karen who says what do you make of some recent representations of the third front in china on the one hand there are independent films of uh wang uh Xiaoshui, himself a famous third front child at zidi and uh, Jia Jiangke, whose 24 City is the one he references, that seem to pay close attention to everyday life as you, as you have. But there are also mm -hmm. some new TV dramas that are more commercial and mainstream. So is there a struggle over the memory and meaning of uh, third front experiences today? And what role does historical scholarship then play in this, I guess, work like yours? So there's definitely different kinds of third front films. I haven't delved into them that much. Initially, I thought I was going to, but there's a guy named James Dawson, who's at the University of Cambridge, who's writing a dissertation specifically on this topic. So I've somewhat decided 
<laughs> this is his territory. <laughs> and uh, you know, maybe I would have less startup costs since I've been studying this for about a decade now, but I've somewhat decided that this is his territory and let, let him do that. Um, as I said at the beginning though of the quick Q&A, I think that there's, if you're gonna look at the memories, they shift over time. Uh, and it, it matters how, what the center is saying and what the provincial governments are saying about the third front and why it matters. In the 80s, it's, 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 it's more crickets. Into the 90s and, and forward, it gets to be more valorized. Um, um, and I think that there's different kinds of stories that are being told. So the stuff that's like Wong Chao Shrai and other stories, some of those stories are stories of really just loss and uh, displacement and misery and broken families. Um, then there's the other stuff, the, the, the TV dramas, I haven't honestly watched them. So I'm not sure, I, I assume that they're different because they're, they've got a longer time period so they, they can delve more into stuff and they're probably more uh, complex. One thing though that I will say about the, the, the some of the stuff that's, so the Wong Chao Shrai and the, um, Coast, you know, what is it, 2420 City or something? Uh, uh, for that movie, I thought it was actually a little bit disingenuous because the way that the movie is portrayed is it's portrayed that this factory is a failure. So it's part of the larger 1990s shutting down of, of the Rust Belt or just getting rid of certain state owned enterprises and these people who lose their jobs, they lose their sense of community, lose their sense of place. But that's not what happens to that factory. That factory becomes Chengfei, becomes Chengdu Aircrafts, which along with Shenyan Aircraft is basically the leading edge of Chinese uh, fighter planes. <laughs> so it's, it, it, I, I thought that movie, it, it played into sort of that larger story of, of failure uh, and sort of abandoned community. But that's, if you go to Chengfei, it's a very nice, part of the 420 factory ends, actually ends up being very nice. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's important to consider partially because if you're interested in the history of military industry in China, uh, you gotta you gotta look at what what Chengdu Fei Zhi is about, uh, but then also it just it, it it makes more sense then because it's not just the story of displacement and, and abandoned community. It's a basic it, it's a story of building up capacity and making it so that uh, China can make airplanes that are not as good as F thirty fives, but maybe people in Pakistan will want to buy them. <laughs> maybe people in Africa will buy them if they really want to put up a lot of money. But yeah, so. Great. Okay, so we, we're at 550, which is close to time, but we have some great questions still. So I propose maybe we'll do one final round of questions, if that's okay. But uh, again, in the interest of time, maybe I'll ask each of the three of them together, and then so you know, have your pen handy, and then and then you can you can answer them uh, all together. Uh, that sounds okay. So the first of those three is uh, from Pat Girsh, who says really enjoying the talk and questions. I haven't had a chance to read the book, but then he asks what what impacts, if anything, do you do these projects have? on the broader region. So far, it sounds like the sites like Panjava were insulated or segregated from surrounding villages, but were there implications for food production, transportation, including your own work on, on the railways or other kinds of things? So sort of what kind of sort of, how did they filter out into the countryside? And then the second, the second question is from Lucy Hornby, uh, who asks, I think you mentioned Pang Dafai visiting Panjava. How much was his plus other disgraced, disgraced top leaders involvement in a project like this a sign that he was being rehabilitated or getting a second chance? So that's sort mm -hmm. of the story. Mm -hmm. And then the third question is from, uh, from Taylor Fravel uh, at MIT, who says, mm -hmm. great talk. How does the planning for the third front interact with, uh, is, is it shape, shape or be shaped by China's elite politics, uh, especially the outbreak and evolution of the Cultural Revolution? So what's the connection to these, these much sort of events happening, I guess, in Shanghai, Beijing, and other major urban centers. Okay, so I'll start with the Pang Dehai question. So with the Pang Dehai question, at least from his memoir, it's actually not his memoir, it's his, his aide, his secretary, so uh, uh, Wong Chunsai, I think is his name, uh, is, uh, he's a, a person who was involved in the Third Front with, with Pang Dehai and then becomes uh, uh, he was assigned, I think, as the secretary when Punk went to the Southwest. What became apparent to me from that, or the way, I, the way I read it, is that when Punk is called to go meet with Mao, and Mao says, you know, we're going to let you do this, basically. We're going to let you be part of this project. Um, but from the memoir, it becomes sort of apparent that it's a way to, at least the way I think of it, is the way to get him out of Beijing. Because Pang Dehai still had a lot of sympathizers. He still had a lot of people who, 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 who didn't think what Mao did originally to him was right. Because um, when he gets to the Southwest, he's basically treated like the plague. 
he doesn't really have any authority. He goes to a lot of places, um, but he, he's, not, he's not viewed as a person who, who's going to be making decisions. It's not a, viewed as a person you want to interact with. He, was sort of, he, he actually lived off sort of in separate areas and didn't interact with other leaders as much. Um, and so I think it was more of a way to shun him to the side and, and get, him out, get him out of problems. I've always had a suspicion, which I don't have any founding for, that it really was literally a way to get him out of the city, uh, out of Beijing in the ramp up for the Cultural Revolution. Because if anybody was going to say anything, he might have been one person who would have said something. And so getting him out of the city and putting him all the way to the Southwest, it made him so that he, he lost his networks, he lost his connections. Um, uh, that's has been a suspicion, but I don't have any evidence to, to actually prove it. So he's definitely not getting a second chance. It's more of a way to get him out of the way. So how does it work with elite politics? Um, so this, I can look at this story, especially in the lead up to uh, uh, the Cultural Revolution, the sort of the start of the Third Front. And the way that I see what happens is that it's a couple things here. One is it's, as this Third Front starts to get discussed, it's at the exact same time that Mao starts to talk about revisionism as being a threat to the party. And that so Soviet revisionism or Soviet ideas are, are sort of rotting the party out from the inside. And it's not just a small problem, it's something that might even be in the elites. And so when he's having these meetings to talk about the third front, uh, Mao's holding these meetings, he'll often switch back and forth. I mean, I don't have the complete uh, transcripts, but it, it, these the meetings are happening on the same day. He'll be switching back and forth between talking about the, the, the danger of revisionism within the party elites and the need to build a third front. Initially, what happens, uh, the way I read the sources, is that people uh, drag their feet. So uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, and uh, Li Futuan, Bo Yibo, uh, uh, other people, they, they drag their feet and say, OK, we'll do studies. We'll, do, we'll send people out to go do stu preliminary studies and learn about this. We're not going to actually send lots of resources into this yet, but we'll do studies. And you can see that they're, that, that, that they're what they're concerned about, because one of the things that they'll say is, uh, so one discussion, Doug and some other people say that if we're going to build these big projects, we're going to have to wage what were called wars of annihilation. So uh, Jimmy and Jan is what they were called. What this meant, that this is something that came out of the, the Great Leap Forward, and what this meant was just mobilizing tens of thousands, if not millions of people to carry out these big infrastructure projects. And you can see that they don't want to do this. Um, um, and it, it, and it becomes apparent that they're concerned about the stuff like the Great Leap Forward happening again, uh, of just carrying out too much uh, building of stuff and that this is going to lead to, uh, to, 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 to disaster or to you know, famine again, or just short, food shortages. And so what happens here is that this, these concerns continue even as the third front starts to get ramped up. So the person I have seen the most about this is, is uh, Liu Xiaoqi, where he actually makes statements of, you know, we don't want to do X, Y, and Z thing, and he uses the phrases which are uh, the, the things that, you know, exaggerating, uh, exagger over-exaggerating um, uh, uh, your output, over-exaggerating your need for resources, or just mobilizing too much resources, and these were the things that, you know, were, were known as bad things they had done during the, the Great Leap Forward. So the way that I read it, what happens is that Mao because of the larger international security environment, also because his own, uh, what he wants to do with the economy of make, carrying out these big uh, 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 industrial projects, there's, there, and the concerns about the party being uh, sort of going soft, is that all of these different factors, are they're all in the cauldron. They're all there. And what happens is once the party, once the central party decides to green light, uh, the, the, the third front project. Um, and this really only happens with the Vietnam War. So it's, it, it really only happens with the Gulf of Tonkin incident. If that hadn't happened, who knows exactly what would have happened. But it's really this the, 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 where the Central Party becomes concerned, okay, we might have another war like the Korean War on our hands. Maybe it, maybe you, the US will go into the North. You know, they start bombing the North. Uh, and, and, and so they're concerned that this might happen. And so then the party starts to, to push, to, to, to agree to it. Why I think this is important is because what it does is it means that Mao wit wins the discussion over what's going to happen with the economy. And so the economy is no longer going to be focused on light industry. It's not going to be focused on, cost, uh, on coastal development. It's not going to be focused as, uh, on like agriculture, which is what initially, initially the third five-year plan was going to be about. It's going to be about 
carrying out large scale infrastructure projects by waging these wars of annihilation all over the place. <laughs> but it's, it, there, there are concessions, you know, there, there is, you can see that there's concerns about centralization. Uh, there's concerns about uh, uh, of impact of mobilizing too many people from, from rural areas uh, and, and how that might impact uh, the, the, uh, the food production and also just uh, people's daily conditions. Uh, but with the launching of the Third Front, th that conversation is kind of over. You're, you're, you're moving into it. It's not the Great Leap Forward, even though they do use the language of the Great Leap Forward. So they're, you know, when I initially saw this, I was kind of shocked. I was like, how can they be talking about Yue Jing again? Didn't this word like get banished like it would seem like it was a not a word you wouldn't want to use anymore but they they still talk you know this this sort of stuff becomes comes back and some of the the, the third the, the the great leap forward uh tactics of self-reliance and other things come back as well um i think there was one more question oh yeah so there's pat gears's question so should, should i take that one too sure. all right so we'll finish on that so mm -hmm. and i think that's a fitting way of sending it so in the last chapter of the book what i argue what you get is these things called development blocks and so this is an idea that I take from somebody else. Um, uh, R.C. Kander and other people wrote a book about uh, the people's energy, I think is what it's called. I'm forgetting what the name of the book is right now. Hmm. And her, the idea is that industrial development is centered around three different energy sources. So there's oil, there's coal, and then there's electricity. And so what I argue is that despite all of the problems that happens with the third front, and there are plenty of problems. I mean, just the statistic that 52 of the projects just decided to get abandoned. I mean, that's a huge amount of, of just, that's not a great success rate. Despite all that, they do build sort of the building blocks of these big development blocks. So the coal industry goes up, the oil industry goes up, electricity networks go up and just electricity production goes up. And so that this the, the idea of creating China is in an industrial country that's not going to just be on the coast or in the northeast, but also in the interior. This becomes more of a, of a reality, and it also, as I was saying before, it gives weight. And, it, and, and as you can see over time, this gets layered more and more upon so that these, these different development blocks are, 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 are really get ramped up in the third front, and then they continue on and continue to get uh, recycled and amplified uh, into the present day. Great, we've we've worked you really hard, but thank you so much. You, you can you can tell. I mean, how, how many from the from the nature of the questions, the variety, how much uh, how much the topic and the you know excites people. Uh, in, 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 I'm going to risk uh, risk your patience, but there's one final question that's on a lighter note. If you want to if you want to just as as your final remarks sort of address it, which is about are, are, are any of these underground cities or facilities now open to the public as tourist destinations? So do they have an afterlife that's much more sort of consumer? Sort of yeah, yeah. Place. So, yeah. so the one place that I that I wanted to go to is there's a factory called the 816 Nuclear Factory, uh, which is on the outside of Chongqing. I was going to go there during one visit, but it's 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 Chongqing is a huge city. I, I mean, Chongqing is a city, so it was like five hours away or something. It's not really near the city, uh, but it's just because Chongqing special region is so big, um, uh, or special municipality is so big. Uh, but there, what it is, uh, and I didn't include it in the images for the talk, but it's, it's an underground nuclear factory, nuclear power factory. Um, and uh, if you look it up, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's 816 uh, Gongcheng or something, or Henan Gongcheng or something like that. If you look it up on Google, you can find it pretty quickly. And it's, it's still there. And it was built so that you could drive tanks into the, you know these huge there's these huge corridors that you can go into to find stuff underground there um and then there's also the the actual <clears throat> nuclear power plant which as far as i know never actually worked um there's also nearby like a lot of third front projects there's a there's a um uh, a cemetery for people who died because a lot of people died building this thing is just they, they literally hollowed out this mountain in order to um, to, to put this thing there. So that's, that's one, that's one that exists. There's other ones that exist, but they're not, uh, I don't know of any other ones underground, but there's other, there's definitely other places that they've done what, uh, uh other places have done. So, you know, 798 is the most famous one, uh, in, 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 in Beijing, but there's, a, in, in, in inland areas, there's a lot of other sort of factories that have been turned into these hit places, <laughs> places right. for hipsters to go and get good food and, you know, listen to music and and uh, dance and and whatnot. So right. there's that. There's definitely that legacy as well. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. And 
you can take a deep breath and relax now. But uh, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. I know uh, we still have 60 people uh, in the audience, so you know you've kept us riveted. So, um, so on their behalf, also thank you. And before they take thank off, you. I just want to quickly plug that we have four excellent talks coming up in the spring. So please join us. We'll have Eddie Yu, uh, the sociologist, Andrew, Andrew Leo, the historian, um, Elena Songster, and also Joe Talmoa from uh, NTU National, Nanyang Technological University. So please look out for those, um, those announcements uh, early in the spring, and we hope you'll join us for them. But for now, I uh, hope you have, everyone has a great end of the semester, and uh, thank you, and thank you especially to, to Karel Maiskins. Yeah, thank you very much. It was great.